Hey everyone, it's the Kung Fu Genius, aka Alex Richter, and you can follow me at the Kung Fu Genius. I got great news for KFG fans. For a limited time, you can get $5 off any order of $20 or more by using the code KFG5OFF at CityWT.com. You can use this code for books, training equipment, t-shirts, and apparel. That code is KFG5OFF, and you can use that $5 off for any order of $20 or more at CityWT.com. And that also includes using it towards my new book, The 15 Chi Cell Fundamentals, which just arrived and is still available while supplies last. The response to the pre-order was amazing, and we only have a few left, so get yours now. And you can always support this channel and podcast in simple ways, like subscribe to the channel, like the video, turn on notifications, and rate it wherever you get this podcast. And with that, let's get started. Hi, peeps. On today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will continue to discuss his time training in the Langenzell Castle in Germany. Lots of gems, lots of doosh, 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 techno music, lots of Kettenfaustausen. Let's get to it! He is unstoppable, unbeatable, unbelievable. He's Alex Richter, the Kung Fu Genius. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> Watch out! Word is, I'm a Kung Fu Genius. Practiced all day like a genius. <laughs> Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? I'm making it happen in the world. <laughs> Yo, it's good to see you, man. It's uh, It's been a minute because people don't realize that we've recorded all those, uh, like the last three episodes, we recorded them together. Then I was in Florida. So actually, that was kind of like old stuff. So I feel like I haven't seen you forever, man. It's been a long time. You know, the apocalypse happened, sun got down. That's right. That's right. So on today's episode, I want to actually continue what we talked about a few episodes back about my time in Germany. We talked about Langenzell, did those stories. Yep, yep. Um, and, you know, a lot of people want to hear more about that stuff. So I thought, okay, uh, let me make a list of all the stories that are appropriate. Get in there. For the podcast. Get in there. And, uh, and I'll continue those there. So if... If anyone out there has not heard that first episode, uh, you probably a good idea to go ahead and listen to that because that kind of sets the stage. I talked about how I almost got into the German military, talked about all that crazy stuff. So I'm going to kind of expand upon that today. Get your elaboration on that. Exactly. Exactly. That's what it's I'm here for. Definitely. That's what I definitely. So, um, so anyway, uh, you know, the first episode we talked about, you know, my martial arts background, all that kind of uninteresting stuff. Um, today, I want to talk a little bit about like some of my teachers and some of the crazy stuff that kind of happened and some stuff that people maybe don't know about. So I want to start with Sivu Bernd Wagner. Most people have seen him on the YouTube video, very yes. famous yes. video of him kind of doing his thing. And uh, he was one of my primary instructors and uh, he was cool. But you know, the crazy thing about training in his class is for many of his classes, he played techno music for like the whole class. Now, I don't know about you, but when I listen to beats, I like something a little more organic. Call it my Cuban side. I do like techno. I'm not going to lie to you. You like techno music? <laughs> Me too. The wow. world likes techno music. Wow. That I must be the only one who doesn't like it. But I realize, like, doing, like, there's a certain percentage of my Wing Chun training in Germany that you could, like, map it on a graph. You could say, okay, like, 7% of all the training I've done, I did while techno music was on, <laughs> right? It must have been part of the part of like my rough transition when I started learning from Sifu Lerng Ting, like because I did everything in a very <laughs> methodical way. Boots, cuts, boots, cuts, boots, cuts, boots, cuts. Right? So I had to kind of break out of that flow and get back to my Cuban Hip, rhythms. Get, get your hip hop on it. Exactly. I see you. Exactly, I right? You. And, you know, so there was a very long time where, like, we, he would put it on for, like, two hours, right? Which is a crazy long time to listen to any type of music, especially techno. And we'd be doing, like, cheese out and sparring and all that kind of stuff. To techno while music. To techno music, right? And so that was... Definitely a different, definitely a different time in my life, right? It would have normally never listened to that music had it not been that I had to listen to it while I was training Wing Chun. Reminisce on it later on? Ab yeah. Well, the pro I, if you held the gun to my head, I couldn't even tell you the name of one techno song or a group that does techno. Captain Faust, Blood Clot, Dowsing. <laughs> <laughs> I always assume that they just have a monkey and a synthesizer and he just hits the, like this and then he just hits it again and hits it again and hits it again. Yeah, and then yeah. they record it and there's your techno song. Steve Bant was a really cool, uh, really cool dude. It's like a lot of people, they always ask me about him because, uh, you know, unfortunately a number of years ago he, he, he passed away. He committed suicide. It's kind of a very... Kind of a weird thing. And you know what's also weird, but YouTube commenters, when I talked to the first video we did about Langensel, right? Some dude commented like, yo, Sifu Band killed himself. 
Shit. And I was like, I was like, well, thank you, because I didn't know that. What what would my life be if not for YouTube commenters telling me stuff that's like pretty damn obvious for people who know, right? It's pretty freaking dark as well. It is, right? And it's just like super weird. And like, so I'm I don't want to like talk about like why or any of that kind of stuff because First, that's not that's not my place to talk about it. What I want to talk about is like the time that I spent with him, right? How we lived, man. How yeah, because he was he was a lot of fun. He used to teach us like lots of cool combinations, and he was like he was the cool kid, right? Mm. Uh, my other primary instructor, Sivo Heinrich, he was like a lot more serious. Get out, right? Sivo Band was like cool. He had like a BMW Roadster. He listened to techno music. He had, like you know, he had blonde hair. Yeah. He was kind of you know like with sunny day, he'd take his shirt off. He, you know, he was like the cool kid. You know, I've seen the videos. He yeah, was, he was laying big boys out, <laughs> laying big boys down. <laughs> yeah, like you know, it was like, it was really a lot of fun training with him. And and I always remember that uh, shortly before I left the castle because it had just been announced that Sifu Lang Teng was going to start teaching in the U.S. Mm. So that meant that we were going to start learning directly from him, right? And he came up to me and he was like, you know, this is going to be a huge, um, a huge evolution in your martial arts career. He's like, you know, you're, you might find that, he told me like, I might find that some of the things I learned there is going to be different than what I was going to learn from Sifu Lang Teng, but he was like, take advantage of it. And he goes, your Wing Chun is going to change so much in the next few years. And I remember that was actually the last thing he said to me. He was like, he he gave me these super encouraging words about my the next phase of my career, which was going back to the States, opening a school and learning directly from Sifu Lang Teng. And, and I'll always remember that because that was super, super, super cool. That's lucky uh, for you. Man. Yeah. That's definitely lucky for you. I wish I wish I had stayed in contact with him, um, but I, I didn't. I didn't, yeah, I mean, it was before the facial books and all that kind of stuff. So it wasn't as easy now. Like, you, to, you, you know, can't hit him on Facebook. You right. can't hit him on Facebook, right? Uh, but um, yeah, I, I miss him always. Like, you know, it's like you always wish you could go back and say something else when someone's not around anymore. But um, yeah. You say give him roses while he was alive. Take that's that, right. Take that, take that. You know, exactly. You know, you know, Dre, you are always the breath of fresh air in this podcast. You know, listen, I'm a, I'm a wise man. <laughs> You know, I'm a wise man. That's for sure. That's why. That's why. That's why I have you here. You know, me and chocolate milk go together. <laughs> Don't even worry about it. Just think about it. So, uh, oh wait, before you go any further, yes. What about your other teacher? I want to know about that gentleman. Uh, I'm gonna talk about Sifu Heinrich, but before Ooh. I talk about Sifu, I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna finish with Sifu Heinrich. All right? <laughs> so I want to talk about some of my training partners because when I did that first episode, I talked about like my Norwegian boys, like Gaute and Jurgen. I told that Jurgen chicken yes. story where he fought yes. the chicken, right? Yes. Talked about Gaute and like, and then I, I I sent it to some of my boys who I trained with at the castle, and then I realized, oh man, I didn't even mention them in the episode. And so I felt kind of bad. So I got to mention some of the other boys that I trained with, you know? Name drop those fellows. Exactly. Name right? drop them. So I trained with this one dude. His name was Mike. But not Mike like you would think. It's M-A-I-K. All right? Mike. All right? And Mike uh, was one of my main training partners. He had a background. I believe he had formerly done some some karate or something like that in the past. He was like... He, he, you ever meet someone, he's like you, but he's just a little bit better in everything. He's like 10%, all yeah, right? That's my other me. That's you. Okay, for you, that's your other you, right? For me, that was Mike, right? He was like a little bit bigger than me. He was a little stronger, a little faster, a little bit, you know, like just a little bit better, you know? And he was my main training partner. And he even, he even lived with me for a little bit. And, and Mike now, he follows Sifu Heinrich. So he mm-hmm. he's continued on his martial arts journey. And I saw him... A couple years ago when I visited Germany, we saw each other for the first time. It was super, super that, cool. That'd be dope. But we used to do stuff like when we were doing the chum cue form. Mm-hmm. Like we were like a little competitive, right? And so the instructor would have us do like the chum cue form. And, you know, we'd all be doing it on our own. And then, you know, in the chum cue, you got the kicks, right? So in, in the WT chum cue, we got the side kick, right? And so let's say he's doing the left side kick and I'm doing the right side kick. Like we're in slightly different parts on the form. And he, I'd look at him. He'd look at me. You know, we we put up the the lance out on the side, lift up the leg and do the sidekick, and we just stare at each other, to see who put the leg down first. Some double dragon stuff going on. <laughs> exactly, in. I, I exactly. See that, I see it. So that was like one of those things. Like we we trained together, and we had like this very kind of very healthy competition with each other, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, back then you didn't have phones, like smartphones and stuff like that. But I remember I had a video camera, and we would occasionally video some of our like uh, training sessions. I got videos of me doing cheese out way back in the day, doing forms. I got all that stuff. We got to see some of that. No one's ever going to see we that got stuff. To see that. You, you will got... find Jimmy Hoffa before you find those videos, Woo! all right? So, and I'll always remember this because it's one of the big ass video yeah, cameras yeah. with the cassettes and everything, VHS, right? VHS, buddy. Yeah, VHS, VHS, right? And I always remember like there, there was a, uh, a time period where Mike lived with me for like 
let's say two months, right? He was in between apartments and he just stayed with me, right? And I wasn't home one day and he used the video camera, right? And mind you, this is before people had a video on their smartphones, right? And I'll, I'll never forget it. I, I had that video, <laughs> I popped the video in, right? Because I wanted to look at some training session I had with Mike. And then suddenly it cuts and like it's him like flexing like a bodybuilder <laughs> in front of the camera, right? Like, like, that's not me. Yeah, and then he's like, you know, turning around, he's popping all like the back poses and like all this. But he he had a really like uh, very, he still does. Mm -hmm. um, he, he had like very wiry physique. He was one of those kind of Bruce Lee types, like yeah. very lean, but like very sinewy and very strong. So like when he was strains, popping those yeah, up. Yeah, little strainy veins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, I need to go back and find that video. Because I have him straight flexing, like it's bring it up on his ass, dude. It looks like um like a Chippendales audition tape, man. It's so great, man. That's your man, by the way. That's your man. That's your man. That's so we all in agreement. That's your man. That's your man. Go for it. So I don't know. I don't know. I suppose it's always good to have some kind of blackmail material, right? Hell yes. Work yeah. for the president. Yeah. So um. <laughs> The president of what? Hair Club for Men? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> this is an apolitical show here, right? There are no politics I meant here. Wakanda. See, Wak I don't even know about that. That's Wakanda's president. That's why he's not around. That's how the Black Panther trained Got it, got it, got it. Uh, so, yeah, so anyway, but Mike's still around. He's still doing martial arts. He's got a school. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's just so cool, like, because not everyone I train with ended up doing something. Some people either ended up doing something else or some people didn't open a school. And so it's interesting to see like the couple people that did go out and make it. They were pretty much the people you thought, yeah, gonna, they were the people that were going to run the nice, school, right? Nice. Yeah, and and so it's like good to see that he's doing well. So everybody stood in Germany pretty much. Yeah, or yeah. Or around Europe. Yeah. Well, I had like, so he was one of my German training partners. There was another dude named Nico. It's a big, tall German dude. Mm. Uh, he trained in China. He had done wushu and sanda kickboxing. And uh, he was cool because he had a bunch of like uh, Chinese movies and stuff. His wife was from China, and she was a, 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 a like a wushu champ. And they actually have a, a a martial arts school in Heidelberg still. Mm -hmm. And so she teaches wushu and they teach and he teaches Chinese kickboxing. And it was cool because like after we trained at the castle, and then like every now and again we'd go out like into the field or whatever, and she would like teach us like some cool ass wushu and like oh, we'd nice. be busting poses and stuff. So, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I mean, basically, I was doing nothing but martial arts the whole time I was there. It was absolutely amazing. Pretty much what you do right now. Yeah, pretty much the same. It was definitely foreshadowing what the rest of my life would be, right? It's all right. That's all right. So, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Like, Nico was there. So, I had Nico. I had Mike. Um, those were my cool uh, like my cool German training partners. The other dudes, they were, like, from Norway. Uh, or there was a dude from crazy stoner dude named Michaela from Italy. I'll tell another story about him some other time. I don't know how appropriate it is. I've been thinking he's there's a crazy story about him and another dude. I don't know about telling that. I'll have to think about it. I might come back and tell that story another time. I don't know how appropriate it is, right? Nope. That's the problem. That's the problem. Maybe I'll put this for my Patreon supporters, right? But not on the regular podcast, right? We want to know how inappropriate that's going to get. <laughs> we want to know. And then there was one dude, he used to be in the French Foreign Legion. And I don't know if you know anything about the French Foreign Legions, but those dudes Little. are they don't know karate, but they know karate. Yeah, I see all right? some movies. Yeah, that dude, like the, 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 it reminds me of the Winter Soldier, or no, it reminds me of the Hulk. You got to go like, hey, the sun's getting low. <laughs> <laughs> you got to like, get low you'd be now. sparring and he'd be on the ground just, and you go, yo, yo, sun's getting low. Oh, you had to like go through the whole thing, yo, take it easy, Mr. Foreign Legion. All shoot. right. Yeah, so we had like lots and lots of crazy characters and, um, you know, it's like anywhere else where you get like a bunch of people together and they're training six hours a day. It's nothing but kind of like mad chaos, you know? And the mix of people who were training was was really wild. It was a lot of fun, man. It was definitely cool. One thing I want to talk about is, you know, some some of my boys, they grew up in East Germany. I don't know how much you know about politics, but at one point, East Germany was separated from West Germany, right? Is that the Berlin Wall? The Berlin Wall. I and understand. so they were communists on that side or whatever. So some of my boys who grew up on the East German side, they didn't have the chance to, you know, because they weren't allowed to practice martial arts in the same way that people in Western Germany were, right? Because, you know, like you can't have contacts with the West and all that kind of stuff. All the martial art books that they would, that they would like get, they were these like Russian martial art books, right? And so they got a book about Bruce Lee in Russian. Now they had to learn Russian in the school, but like 
they didn't really know because it's like they learned in the school they can't really speak Russian, right? So they were trying to like figure out exactly like what the hell this thing was, right? It says that Bruce Lee has these like uh, battle cries. Wow. They thought they figured out what those battle cries were. What were they? So they came. So my boy Nico came up with each gum tossen. All right, each gum tossen. All right. What, what is each? What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's kind of like you, you know, it's like in English when you say like you know you know, bang, boom, bop, or you say, oh. <laughs> ba-doom, right? It's like these like random words that are they're just, they're, they're for describing sounds, right? Yes. So they came up with each gum tossin, right? So they had this idea, like, you know, if, I don't know, if you fire like a left punch, it's like each, and if you fire a right punch, it's like gum, and if you fire a kick, it's like tossin, right? Yes. So it's like each gum, each gum, each, each, each gum, tossin, tossin, <laughs> right? And so they thought that was like the shit, right? Until they finally saw their Bruce Lee movie and realized, oh no. It doesn't work that way. It's like, what are you? It's something totally different, right? And so they were like blown away. I, I don't, they probably were disappointed, you know? Because in their mind, they thought they got it, you know? Like another weird thing about Germany, you know, Germans, they dub everything into German. All like foreign stuff with occasionally like some films can get subtitles. They have to dub it into German. Mm. Whereas like uh, countries that are not as big, let's say like Denmark, they just show the movies in English and use subtitles. That's why like a lot of people in Scandinavia have really good English because they watch all of our stuff in English. They just watch it with subtitles. Germans, it's got to be dubbed in German. But you know how Germans are. They're so by the book. Germans are like this. They get the same voice actor to dub the same actor in every movie. So like the German dude who does Will Smith always <laughs> does Will Smith. Right. Oh, so oh, okay. So you're saying like like that's one guy who does one Will guy Smith. does like. Uh, so every time Will Smith gets a movie, the same German voice actor does the voice for him. And if they so get, it's like, literally the same dude from Fresh Prince of Bel Air to like Will Smith's latest movie. So that's why oh. if you do the voice dubbing for some up and coming actor, and that dude takes off, man, you're set because oh, you're gonna do all that guy's movies. That's sweet. You do like. Um, Robert De Niro, it's always the same guy, right? And the funny thing is sometimes, like, I'll be watching something like, I don't know, Family Guy or The Simpsons nice. in German, right, when I'm over there. And then, like, I'll play the English one. They're like, ah, oh, they sound wrong in English. <laughs> it's like, what? What, so, what does the Peter sound like is what I... It's... Yeah, it sounds totally different, right? So I can imagine in their minds, they're reading this book, they think it's like, each gum tossing, and then they hear him go, Whoa! like this, and it's like... Were they disappointed? Oh, that right? sucks, dude. You know that what I mean? Because in their mind, it's like they thought it was this, and now he's like, you know, he's screaming like a hyena, right? And th th that was not, <laughs> that was not what they had in their mind, right? So you know, so that was like kind of like some of the weird, so like the cultural things you learn when you're over there, right? And uh, another weird thing that was going on at the time, it's still kind of going on, is this in the WT world, like the Leung Tang Wing Chun world. There's a bit of a schism between like Europe and Hong Kong. It's not an iron curtain. It's like a uh, hard to see through shower curtain. <laughs> there's a division between Europe and Hong Kong. And this, it's like there's historical reasons for this. The EWTO, which is the European Wing Chun Organization, they're mm -hmm. like the European wing of Sifu Leung Ting's organization. They're the biggest part. You know, when Sifu Leung Ting talks about how successful his association is, yeah. he's really talking about how successful western <laughs> europe is right it's not like he's not talking about america or the other countries where he's got wing chun. he's really talking about europe mm -hmm. so the, the success of of his wing chun is really because of sifu kanchbeck because of the ewto yeah and so he kind of he takes a little bit of credit it's his system but he takes a lot of credit for it's called the coat tailing coat tailing right coat -tailing. or clout chasing Cla right you know i ain't 690 but go for it <laughs> i'm not gonna bring it up you did go for it way back in the 80s right some German Wing Chun guys, WT guys, they traveled to Hong Kong. And they did it like kind of on the sly. You know what I mean? Like they didn't, they didn't say what was going on. And they ended up going to Hong Kong. And here's the problem with like the way Sifu Leung Ting does stuff and some of his instructors in Hong Kong. They go, oh, you learn, you learn Wing Chun in Germany, all right? Like you're technically from the same family, right? But what are the guys in Hong Kong going to do? They're going to say, ah, everything you're doing is wrong. They would say that anyway, even if you were learning there in Hong Kong. So, But they're going to go, oh, you come from our association. Oh, no, your form is no good. This is no good. They're going to tell them everything they're learning is wrong. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to teach them. And they're going to teach them a bunch of stuff that they probably wouldn't have had a chance to learn in Germany in the same amount of time. Right? Gotcha. So basically it happened like some guys went to Hong Kong. They learned a bunch of stuff they shouldn't. 
or they weren't quite qualified for. They went back to Germany and they were like, oh, I already learned all this stuff in Hong Kong and I don't need to like learn step by step oh. the way, whatever. And this caused some trouble. All right. There are more details. And I told a very broad general version of it because I don't want to get into who that was and all that kind of stuff. Yes. But basically it, it caused a big problem. They ended up like that guy had to leave the association, ended up being like a real big deal. So then there was this thing. OK, for all the European peeps, if they're going to go to Hong Kong to train, they need to get permission with the European headquarters, not because, oh, they're going to go over there and learn secrets. But when they go over there, the, the, the Hong Kong Chinese guys are going to try to mind F them a little bit. And gotcha. then they're going to come back either thinking that they can't do anything or they're going to come back thinking they can do everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that created this little bit of a schism. Right. So anyway, Sifu Lengting knows and he's known since the 80s. He's not really supposed to teach people who come from Europe, in particular Germany, right? That's the thing. But yet he's not supposed to do it without permission in Hong Kong, all right? Obviously, it's one thing if he goes to Europe, right? But like the Germans and the other Europeans, if they came to Hong Kong, they had to get like, you had to get your, your visa and your passport stamped, mm. if you understand what I'm saying, yeah, before yeah. you could do that, just to make sure they kept an eye because Sifu Leung Ting can be a bit duplicitous, all right? Yes. It's a word that I like, yes. all right? And so... Uh, he knows and he knew he wasn't supposed to teach but here's something crazy he constantly got in trouble for teaching these dudes in Europe that he wasn't supposed to teach and he still does it alright there was one guy I'm not gonna mention his name he's got an Italian name alright okay he went over he went over and learned from Siva Langtang for a few years right he wasn't supposed to do it and he was even a black sheep from the European Wing Chun organization right like he was already not in good standing with the European organization, right? And he went over and started learning privately from Sifu Leung Ting for a few years. Mm. And this was crazy. Sifu Leung Ting knew that he wasn't supposed to teach this guy. And you know what he did? He put this dude in his book, Roots of Wing Chun. All right? Like, we I can tell go you, back and check that. Dude, sometimes, you, dude, you don't, like, he's, he's like, he's insane. All right? He's completely insane. All right? <laughs> and so... I re and the reason I know is when I was in Germany, we were at a seminar and Sifu Leung Ting had come to Germany and he had his new Roots of Wing Chun book at that time, which is the big book about the history of Wing Chun, yeah, right? Yeah. Anyway, this black sheep dude that he put in the book, his former teacher was at that seminar. His former teacher had no idea that this dude was learning from Sifu Leung Ting because as far as he knew, this guy was booted out. He wasn't part of anything, right? Oh. So I'm at the Sifu Leung Ting seminar in Germany training with my boys. We're always in the front row because like, we always want to be front and center, listen when he has something Get to say. Knowledge. And yeah, and also like in Germany, they would always have someone translate him at the seminar, right? Mm -hmm. And it was funny because like one, I understand German, I speak German, I speak English, and I also speak Chinglish, all right? <laughs> the problem is most of the Germans who are translating for him, they right. speak English, they don't speak Chinglish, and they have a really hard time. And I'm not saying that to like make fun of them, but... It happens. There's an accent and there's a way of expressing yourself that if you're not familiar with how Chinese people speak, it's going to be very difficult. And I remember sitting there, Sifu Leung Ting would say something, and then I would hear the, the dude translate in German, and I'd be like, oh, that's not what he said. That's not what he said by a long shot, right? Yeah. And so I, that's why I was always front and center there to like listen and kind of hear it like you know with my own ears, right? And anyway, Sifu Leung Ting pulls out his book, Roots of Wing Chun, and says, this is my new book, you know? And then he, he, he's showing, he's all about the history, about the different styles. And then I remember some German guy, he raises his hands, he goes, C-Yo, because in German, a J is pronounced Y. It's supposed to be c Jo because this is yes. someone who's yes. like a great grand student of Sifu Leung Ting. He's like, he means to say c Jo. <laughs> he goes, c Yo," <laughs> And Sifu Leung Ting just looks at him, he's like, what? Like, he, he literally doesn't know what he's saying, right? It's like, you know, it's si jo, it's not yo, right? And then he goes, when is the book coming out in German, right? And then Sifu Leung Ting, so gangster, he goes, no, 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 the book is in English, but the photos are in German. <laughs> See, <laughs> which, that, that, that's your man right there. <laughs> which, that's means, your man. which means he's not translating it. At all, right? all he's buddy. He's telling you, At right? all, buddy. You can buy it. Yes, the words are in English, but the photos are in German just for you, buddy. Right, go, right? go. Spend them dollars, bucko. Spend them dollars. So anyway, you can see that, you know, the guy who called him CEO was a bit, you know, displeased with that answer, right? Anyway, we go back, we're training, we're doing our thing. And then I see the instructor, the former instructor of this black sheep, 
Mm. He he goes up there. He starts thumbing through the new book as Sifu Langting left it on the and his man is the right there. there and he sees him in there. I don't at this point. I didn't know who this Italian named guy was. Right? I didn't know. He he wasn't. No one knew who he was. That he was a as Sifu Langting would say at that time he was a Mister Nobody. Right? So we're training and suddenly. I see like, and the guy, <laughs> the guy's my seeing, right? And he kind of stiffens up and he calls Sifu Langting over. He's pointing at the book and you can tell he's like super agitated. He's like, this guy is he's kicked out of the association or this guy's kicked out of my school and why is he in here or whatever? And you just see Sifu Langting is like kind of caught. He doesn't want to admit because he knows. That he knew he wasn't supposed to teach this dude. He likes to use sins of omissions and plausible deniability. Like, oh, I wasn't sure. Oh, did he, was he really part of the EW? I thought he was just some oh. random Italian named guy who came to train with me privately who already happened to have rank. I didn't know he was European. It's like, come on, come Dude, on. Dude, get right? that extra money. Get yeah, that extra money. And then you money. just see him there and he's just like, he's the, he's the proverbial kid caught with his hand in a cookie jar, right? So anyway, at that point I knew well, something was up. I looked at the book while he was explaining. I saw the photo of the guy. All right, there's something up with this dude, right? And so later, you know, we would find out that this guy, he was learning privately from Sifu Langting, and he wanted to, you know, oh, you know, at some point he was going to open a school, and he was originally going to do it for Sifu Langting. Maybe he was going to open a school in New York. Maybe he was going to do something somewhere else. Mm. But then he decided, like, nah, I'm not going to work with this dude who's been teaching me. I'm going to do my own thing. But the problem is I need, he still needed to learn the weapons at that point because Sifu Lang Ting, he kept going like, when are you going to teach me to pull? When are you going to teach me the knives? Because I guess that was the only thing he had not learned, right? And Sifu Lang Ting said, well, if you open a school or you do something oh. in a very kind of gangster way, like, hey, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours yeah, kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think he didn't want to have to go through those final hoops to learn the weapons, right? So he found some ex-student of Sifu Lang Ting who had learned the weapons 85 years ago or something like that. And then just went to him, learned the weapons, and then totally backstabbed Sifu Leung Ting and opened his own association, right? And then ends up being the biggest thorn in Sifu Leung Ting's side. Because here's the thing. Sifu Leung Ting was like building this guy up because mm -hmm. he wanted him to be a competition for the guys in Europe. Like, I'm going to trade. You know, everyone wants him to be Yoda. But yeah. we have to admit, dude's Palpatine, all right? He's not Yoda. He's palp He's got the dark side That's power. Some dark analysis you're yes. coming with right now, man. Dark analysis. He's got the dark side for he dude. He can do the force lightning. I've seen it. All right. Okay. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> and he will teach you the force lightning. The cost oh. will be your soul. Okay. But he'll oh. teach it to you. Everyone wants him to be Yoda. He's not Yoda. He's That's Palpatine, so cool, right? Man. And so anyway, uh, he's training this guy up because he wants him to you know what's weird the european wing chun organization is on one hand the most successful part of sifu Langting's kingdom if you will yeah. Yeah. but it's successful not really because of him it's successful because it's well managed because they, they've done it in their own way and they've catered to that market and sifu Langting, you would think he'd be happy like i'll tell you something dre if you were running an entire country teaching city Wing Chun, and you were doing a really good job, all right? And I was earning good money from it. Your students were, everyone was happy. You were doing a good thing. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't go, mm, I'm going to train up someone to go in there and mess up your game. Why would I do that? It's like shooting yourself in the foot. But he kind of like does stuff. Like he will do things that kind of destroy his own success, things that make zero sense. You're like, why are you doing this, right? Uh. This guy is your most successful boy. He's the reason, he's literally your meal ticket. And, and, you, and you're trying to shit on him. It makes no sense, right? Meanwhile, he can do things elsewhere and build up stuff, but he wants to like shit on the one part of his kingdom that's actually making him a lot of money, right? It makes no sense. So he was training this guy partially to go in there and be maybe a usurper of the EWTO, which, mm. make, which is completely batshit crazy, right? Yeah. And ends up, this guy leaves him, backstabs him, right? Gets his own kind thing of going. Learning a lot from the master, right? Mm. And opens his own association and ends up taking tons of people from the European Wing Chun organization. At some point, like Italy, which was at one point a very strong part of the EWTO, this dude with the Italian name ends up taking like almost half or maybe even more of the Italian European Wing Chun schools. So Sifu Leung Ting in like creating this little monster, that monster ends up taking money out of his pocket, right? That guy ends up 
actually hurting Sifu Leung Ting in the pocketbook, right? And this was a guy that he was scheming, even wants to put him in the book to show, ah, you tell me I can't teach people, I'm going to teach him anyway, and I'm going to put him in my book, right? Oh. Like, you know, say something, I'll use my force lightning on you, right? <laughs> but it ends up shooting, he ends up shooting himself in the foot. And this is like a constant recurring theme, unfortunately, with Sifu Leung Ting. But I say, like, if you have time to spend with him, because he's got a lot of haters out there, and I get it, when people don't like him or people want to say shit about him or say that he's shady, I get it, man. I get it. All right. I left him 10 years ago. All right. When you have time to spend with him and you have time to really learn from him, you realize he is really brilliant. He doesn't rep represent himself very well sometimes in the way he promotes himself. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't make very smart decisions. Right. Which it makes it very difficult to defend him. Right. And I get it. Right. But like when you look at what he did, and you kind of go like, mm, I kind of see the pattern there a little bit, you know? And he even calls his most loyal boys. You know, he's got a name for people who are super, super loyal to him. He calls them loyal idiots. Like, you know, royal idiots? Oh, Not damn. The loyal idiot that's cold. Is cold, right? Yeah, that's very and, cold. And the crazy thing is, like, all of his boys here in the States, like his head instructor, the guys who are still ahead of his association, mm -hmm. most of them are mainly the reason why I left. I didn't really leave because of Sifu Lang Cheng. I left because it's, it's managed by a confederacy of dunces. Mm. The worst things I heard about his senior students in the U.S., because people think I'm salty against it, most of the bad stuff I heard about them, he told me. These are the guys who still represent his super... I mean, his U.S. association has dwindled to almost nothing. And he's got only a couple loyal boys. But they're loyal, not like... Like, like you are loyal, you know? You come, you do the work, you come in day in, I day out. I do what right? I gotta do. But there are people, they're just sitting on a shelf. And they're collecting dust. They're not doing anything, but they're still on that shelf. The Kool-Aid is strong with them. That, but that's not loyal. When someone is just sitting there and not doing anything and collecting dust, I don't consider that loyal. I consider the person's not doing anything, right? Loyalty for me is an action, a day in, day out, showing, mm -hmm. doing the work, putting in the time, not just sitting there and doing nothing. And he calls all of his U.S. Uh, head students, he calls them country boys. And he means it like because they are... They don't know how to run schools. They don't know how to run anything. He's like, oh, they're my country boys, but at least they're loyal. Yeah, but they're loyal like a cup collecting dust on a shelf, oh, right? Dude. And all the saltiest stuff I heard from that. But then you look at Europe, which is the part of the reason why I went to go train over there, not in the States. They had a full-time academy, Langensel Castle. I was training there. I could train six hours a day, five days a week. Top instructors. Everything is just like just top-notch. Like... That is where his association is doing really well. And then you look at like where it's not doing well and he's got all these yes men, these country boys, and he's still the doing all man, these like, man. he's you know, it's like Machiavelli, except he does it wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like he's trying to be Machiavellian, but he just, he keeps shooting that force lightning in his own foot. When this <laughs> Italian guy came out and then of course everyone found out, oh, he's teaching this guy, he shouldn't be teaching this guy. This guy backstabbed him. He, he backstabbed the EWTO, blah, 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 blah. Uh, he, you would think he learned his lesson, right? You would think, okay? I'll tell you something. In the times I went to Hong Kong, whether it was for Fight Quest or for private training or for whatever reason, there's almost never been a time when I was in Hong Kong during that time when I was still in the association mm -hmm. that there wasn't some German dude in Hong Kong learning at the headquarters. And that dude was not there with permission from the EWTO. I remember I talked talk to my wife about this. We were at a hotel. We were going down the elevator. And some tall-ass German goes, are you a Sifu Alex? I'm going to turn and look, right? It's like, oh, people know where I am no matter where I go, right? Dude had an obvious German accent. I go, oh, uh, yes. I go, uh, where are you from? He's like, I'm from Germany, all right? <laughs> of course, in my mind, I'm like, I know you're from Germany, right? <laughs> And then I go, oh, what are you doing? He goes, I'm training Wing Chun. I'm like, oh, who do you train Wing Chun with? I'm training with Sifu Leung Teng. And I'm like, oh. I was still in the association at that time. I knew the rules, right? And I'm going like, you know, so I, I fish a little bit, right? Oh. And I go like, oh, are you, um, do you train in Germany? And, and you're also coming over here? Or do you live in, because look, if a German guy moves to Hong Kong, he just lives in Hong Kong, of course he can train and learn Wing Chun there. Mm -hmm. The problem is when he's already doing Wing Chun in a school and then he's going back and forth, that's where the problems occurred, right? And I'm not saying I agree with that or what. I'm just saying that's what it is, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes people in the comments, they confuse me telling stories about what happened with, with me with. being in agreement with them. I'm just saying 
what happens. That's all, right? all you can do. So I go like, oh, are you training in a Wing Chun school? Of He's like, yes, I'm training in a Wing Chun school in Germany. He told me like some small town. But I'm also here doing private training with Sifu Lang Tang. I'm like, oh, okay, enjoy. And after all, it's like after all that, he still didn't learn his lesson, right? Now, mind you, this guy was a small potato. So he was some white shirt dude or whatever, right? Oh, but still, but just still. Just that extra. That right. It's still. He's like, he's that, he's got that addictive personality where he just can't help it, right? Let, let me drop a gem here. Let me see. Like, is it a money thing? Uh, it could be. You although, know, like, like although I'm getting German be. money. I mean, it, it's the real world, you know? No, I, I get it. So, I mean, I don't know. It shouldn't be. All right. Let's just say that his financial arrangement with the European Wing Chun Organization should be in such a way that he doesn't need to. T- I mean, how much is he learning? Nickel and yeah. dime, get a couple yeah. private lessons here, right? At this point in his career, he should quite frankly be retired, right? Mm. When you were at that age and you got to teach Bong Sao for cash, especially when you had a huge association, all right? If you have a huge association, you should be able to retire, enjoy, and just teach whoever wants to come every now and again. You do it because you enjoy it. You shouldn't at that point in your career do it because you have to. You, you know, yeah. At that point, you're teaching Bong Sao for cash because you need to eat. I think you messed up. They say you know facts I mean? on that. Facts yeah, on that's it. what I'm saying, right? So anyway, like that's the thing. So he never learned that lesson, right? And these were things that I would start to hear about while I was in Germany. But I uh, I didn't really see it until years later and I started training with him and just realized, you know, he he, if you were an instructor, you'd invite him to come teach a seminar. And uh, while at the seminar, he'd go and hit up your senior students and be like, yo, you should open a school like like down the street. Get the focus yeah, out of here. Yeah, yeah. Shut the front door. That's 100% the way he was. Wow. Yeah. That's raw. Yeah. He does that kind of stuff all the time. And then he wonders why. You know, it's like, it's like, Ma- it's very Machiavellian, but it's like not executed well. You know yeah, what I mean? We're not, it's up. not Tupac style. All right. I'll yeah, tell you that much. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of weird, right? So, anyway, I didn't know that stuff at that point. For me, I just said, you know, I had the rose colored glasses. At that point, I was in Germany learning from those guys. Sifu Band tells me, hey, when you go to the States, you're going to have a chance to learn from him directly it's going to be huge and he was right i can parse out what i learned from him on the wing chun side of things i can separate that from like who he was and who he is mm-hmm. right and you mm-hmm. have to mm-hmm. there's people who can't do that they think that like an attack on sifu lang character is an attack on him as a martial artist or anything like that. you can separate those two yeah. things and Scaling quite frankly skill, it's yeah. not just him all right most people need to to a certain degree be able to separate correct the martial artist from the skill from, from yeah from the and, skill and, and from the from person how the, yeah. how the person is because if you're really looking for that guy who's the saintly buddha and the kick-ass fighter and you want that all in one package that there are people out there like that i know a couple people they're absolute saints of men who are and and, and women who are phenomenally skilled in martial arts but i'll tell you they're few and far between mm. all right and uh it's not necessary you know you can get your philosophy from the philosophy genius you can get your martial arts from some martial arts genius, right? But you, it doesn't have to, have to be the same person, right? Mm-hmm. And the moment you realize that this person that you might follow for martial arts instruction, I mean, provided that they're not just like the worst person in the world, you, you, you can free yourself and allow that person to just be what they're good at and allow you to go and get that from them without putting them on a pedestal that when you start to see the cracks... Mm-hmm you got to defend it because you got to start doubling down because you have put them on that pedestal. Correct. You got to be able to parse those things out. And I think many of Sifu Learning Tank students have a hard time doing that. But to be fair, most students of any martial arts instructor have a hard time doing that. So, yo. When you were in this castle, Mm -hmm. right? So who were your instructors in the castle? So for the first... And if you're mine, in in the day-to-day living, tell me, I want to know a little more. People want to know. Well, I talked about this in the first that siren, video. That siren, remember you, you remember the story with the sirens? The, the sirens? Brrr, when they, they they militarize you when you get to the castle? <laughs> yeah, man, tell tell the people about no, the no, military. No, no, that was in, uh, no, occasionally there would be a... Uh, That's the techno. An, an instructor, it wasn't the techno. <laughs> no, there was an instructor, he taught, um, he taught the police, like um, the SWAT teams. And he would have come occasionally, not every month, uh, but he would come regularly, every couple months or something like that. And we would do like the training the way the police would do it, right? And sometimes that would, in, you know... Sense in deprivation. Sensory deprivation. Yes. We did some kind of wild stuff. Uh, yeah, and that was really interesting. That was a lot of fun. We love But that. those, usually after those days, you are you went home and your hands are kind of shaking <laughs> like this, right? You can't do that kind of training all the time, right? It's like that Pink Panther guy jumping out at you every five minutes. Yeah, yeah, Kato. <laughs> yeah. You have him in the corner waiting. And yeah. he always comes at the worst moment, <laughs> yeah. right? You're like yeah. super tired. You got to go pee and then he just whacks <laughs> you in the back of the head, right? 
Yeah. Uh, so we had that. I talked a little bit about the day to day in the uh, first episode, yes. which I'm sure you remember because yes, you, yes, were, you yes. were there. Yes. Uh, but basically, for the first, let's say, year and a half, two years, I think, Monday was Sifu Bent. So we had him for all six hours, two three hour sessions. He had a three hour session in the morning and in the evening with a little break in between. So we had Sifu Bent on Monday. Tuesday, we had Sifu Heinrich, Heinrich Pfaff. Uh, Wednesday, we had Sifu Bent again. Then for like the first year, every Thursday, we had a guest master class. I mean, we had a different fifth level practitioner came every Thursday. So that's why I had a chance to see Sifu Tazo, Sifu Manes, oh. Sifu Edel, Sifu Ring Eyes, and all of those guys. I had a chance to see everyone, those right? Pretty much all the greats right there. Man. Oh, yeah. That was like kind of the OG, older generation, right? And then Friday was Sifu Bant again, right? And then they stopped doing the guest master classes after about mm, maybe the first year, maybe eight months I was there. Because I think it was difficult to coordinate that every week. And then Sifu Heinrich took over on Thursday. So that meant I had Sifu Heinrich three times a week and I had Sifu Bant twice. That's a bad man majama. Yeah. That's a real bad man And like I mentioned in the first one you had people that were more partial to Sifu Bant's way of teaching and people who are more partial to Sifu Heinrich uh, and you had people that would only show up to Sifu Bant's days and people who would only show up on Sifu Heinrich's days right we went we went to all of them right we loved it but I was definitely more on team Sifu Heinrich right because he was uh Free. There was something about him, like one, he was so skillful, yeah. and he um, also like he was in the kung fu movies. He was in other martial arts. He he, he had a much he had a very broad. And I'm not saying Sifu Ban didn't. I'm just saying he had a very broad idea of martial arts outside of just the WT and the Wing Chun. That as an American coming from a very you know growing up on different movies and having taken different martial arts, mm-hmm. I appreciated that, and I definitely kind of like. Um, yeah, I kind of, you know, followed that way of doing things a little bit, right? But I'll get I'll get back to him in a moment, oh, right? You know we want to get with him. Yeah. We want to get then, with him. And then the last year, Sifu Heinrich pieced out. He had there was some disagreement. All right. Uh I don't know exactly what it was, but there was another instructor in Frankfurt. All right. I'll say his name because I don't know him personally. And I also didn't really like him. If they're fans of him out there, that's fine. All right. Uh, Gangster, buddy, his name right? was his name was Roland, all right? I'll just say Roland, all right? He was a big-time instructor in Frankfurt. Lots of schools, very, very big guy. Uh, of all the Wing Chun instructors, uh, he was, like, one of the big money business guys. He had lots of schools and stuff like mm-hmm. that. But he wasn't, like, really someone that was appreciated for his skill, but he was a business guy. And he had a tight control over Frankfurt, what the students could do, where they could train. And he didn't like Sifu Heinrich because some of his students went to the castle, trained with Sifu Heinrich, learned a bunch of stuff that they really liked, came back, and they were like, yo, we learned this and look Open how and he got kind of jealous. Right? Mm-hmm. He didn't like that. Right. So he was always causing trouble for Sifu Heinrich from what I understood. And then one day it came to a head. I don't know what it was, but I know like Sifu Heinrich went up to the office and I think Roland was there. Maybe he wasn't there. And there was some shouting or some words or whatever. And Sifu Heinrich left and he just quit. He didn't quit the EWTO. He quit teaching at the castle. Literally one day they came down like, oh, Sifu Heinrich's not going to be your instructor anymore. Who did they replace like, him with? They replaced him with Sifu Thomas Schroen, my Siheng. And uh, so he taught, he took Sifu Heinrich slots on like Tuesday, mm. Thursday, Friday for like the last year, year and a half I was there. And then I started learning from him and he was also awesome. Very different from Sifu Heinrich, but just a badass. And like he's still, he's one of the highest graduated guys in the EWTO. He's also, I think, a black belt Brazilian jiu-jitsu now. Dude's a badass. All right. And um, so he was great. So it wasn't like... They replaced them with someone like Sivu Thomas Schroen was is an absolute badass. And mm-hmm. I learned mm-hmm. so much from him. Mm-hmm. And a lot about like the way that I do certain things about the aspects of testing. Uh, I still do like some stuff that I got from him. Nice. But anyway, now Sivu Heinrich, he was still part of the EWTO, but he wasn't teaching at the castle. And he taught once a week at his school for four hours on Tuesday. So he had like not quite six hours, but four hours. Mm-hmm. And his school was about 45 minutes drive from where I was. So I started going to him every Tuesday. So I, I had to get my Sivo Heinrich fixed. Yes, sir. So I was going to the castle Monday. I would drive up to Sivo Heinrich on Tuesday. And then the rest of the week, I would train at the castle. But I was trained, still trained with him four hours a week for that last year or so. Because he was like my man. I mean, I, I like, I really, there was something about the way that he did things. There was something about the way he explained stuff that really appealed to me. And uh, and I loved it. But you keep trying to bring me back to Heinrich. I'll, I'm, like, he, I'm finishing with him today. He, he's he is a bad the, mama jamma man. He's the, he's, the, he's the centerpiece of this episode. We're getting there. We're yeah, getting you, there. I, I don't, you people must see this out in the world. I want to check those YouTube I wanted, videos. I wanted to tell a story that not a lot of people know. Ooh. There was a, uh, in fact, I don't think anyone except my training partners at the time knows. There was a, there was a master in the EWTO. His name was Tazos. Yeah, right? but... Tazo's a Greek guy. 
All right. And he's also from that kind of old school first generation. Mm. Tazos is short guy. He's like me. He's even a little shorter, right? Yeah. Very dynamic. Yeah. Very dynamic Wing Chun guy. And he, he had like, I think pound for pound, he had one of the hardest punches in the EWTO. He could do like, he could do like the step and punch, knock people really, really far back. Really powerful, dynamic dude, right? But he had a temper control problem. All right. He was, he was one of those hot blooded Greeks. All mm. right. And I, I only saw him at a couple guest master classes. And you know, he liked to kind of smack students around, whatever. That's, their instructors are like that. We've all learned from him. That's okay. I don't have a problem with that, right? But um, of all the different masters that I learned from, he wasn't like one of my favorites. I thought he was one of the most skillful. But for me, all of those dudes were skillful. The difference, the difference oh, yeah. between one dude and the other is, can this guy teach me something? Trick. Because some guys would come, like the guest masters would come on Thursday. The one guy would come, he would just beat the shit out of everyone just to show how awesome he was, right? Mm -hmm. And you'd be like, okay, I saw a couple things, but he was kind of there for himself. Correct. The other guy would come in, maybe he didn't really show off too much, but he was teaching, he was training, he was explaining, he would show you stuff. You'd be like, wow. You would leave that, you'd be sweating because you got good training and you learned something. And mm -hmm. you go, that dude is awesome. Yes, sir. Next guy would come in, do, 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 smack you around, show how awesome he was. All right, he's good, but didn't teach me shit. He's good, but he didn't make me better. So what does it matter? You know what I mean? Yeah. So Tazos was one of those guys. I didn't have too much contact with him. But then there was a big seminar in Germany uh, in 2001. It was the 25th anniversary of the EWTO. Now, because I was a Castle student, me and my boys, Mike and Nico and all these mm -hmm. guys, we were the staff of this a huge, it was more than a seminar, it was a huge event. Because it was like over multiple days, they invited Sifu Langting. Sifu Langting brought Hawkins Chung, who's one of Yip Man's oh, students. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you had all the EWTO masters. It was a huge event. They had a show, they had demonstrations. And every day you had, you could do a screamer. And then, uh, you know, at one o'clock you did a screamer with, the, you know, some instructor. And then at three o'clock you do Wing Chun with Sifu Langting. And at five o'clock you do Wing Chun with this other instructor. And because we had the passes, because we were, staff because yeah. we were castles they gave us staff passes all i did was just go to the sifu lang ting ones because it'd be like if you're a student uh student levels you see sifu lang ting this day but if you're this level like black shirt you got to go at this time so the black shirts couldn't go during the lower level stuff because they had so many people there they had to divide it up by level so it wouldn't be too full but because I had a staff badge, I, I just I went to every every single time Sifu learned to. It didn't matter if he was teaching beginners, I was there. Yeah. Teaching even the advanced practitioners above my pay grade, I was there. Oh, I'm staff. So I'm there watching, right? Yeah. And yeah. I so that was like the whole thing that that was the seminar where Sifu Emin was disinvited. Because uh, that was about the time when they were like choking you know, things started going started on. Started going. He was supposed to be there, and then suddenly he wasn't there. He had been disinvited. I'm not gonna relitigate that shit. But I'll tell you one crazy thing that happened regarding our boy Tazos, right? So Tazos, very dynamic fighter, all right? And he was fifth, sixth level master, thick stripe, you know, seriously, he'd been around. And Sifu Langting knew him. Sifu Langting even went to China with him or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And Sifu Langting wants to demonstrate the first attack and the first attack defense. From On Chis it. Yeah, from Chi Cell Program 1, right? And so he's, he's explaining it to, to the mid-level students, right? So he grabs Tazos. All right, because Wrong time Taz to do that, Bucko. No, because Tazos is a, is a high level instructor. So the assumption is, I can demonstrate something with this guy because this guy knows what he's doing, right? So Siva Lang Ting's doing chi sao with him, and he goes to give him the first attack. And Tazos is like, he's he's super hectic. I could even see it. I was a, I was not a technician yet, but I could see he was very like very jumpy. I mean, that's probably what makes him so dynamic that he's like a very jumpy guy. Mm -hmm. But he's like, you know, Siva Lang Ting is going like. He's going slow. He's demonstrating the technical program, right? And he's going like Kanunu Reeves in the Matrix. He's like Kanunu go, Reeves. Kanunu Reeves. Tai Chi <laughs> through Jello on Quaaludes. All right. He's showing the movement step by step. And Tazo's like, he keeps time warping. He keeps like going really fast, mm. right? And Steve Langton says, hey, slow down. Hey, hey, hey. Just to, he just wants to show it to you. He, he keeps trying to have to like scold him like a child, right? Oh. All right. And, and the thing is, all Tazos has to do is just move with him. And he's like being very jumpy and very ugh, like mm -hmm. nervous. Like, I get people are nervous when Siva Lang Teng, especially if you have not had a lot of chance to spend with him, right? Siva Lang Teng gets fed up. He tries it like three times. And the guy like, the guy is so jumpy, he can't even demonstrate a simple thing with him, right? And so he tells him, eh, and he pushes him to the side and he grabs me. Okay. Let's kind of clap on everyone. Uh, <laughs> no, and the only reason. There it is. There it is. 
I didn't say it for that reason. I had only said it because I had worked with him earlier and he knew that I spoke English, whereas Tazos doesn't speak English. Um, so I think he thought it wasn't that, ta- like, to be fair, maybe language Tazos, barrier. maybe there was a language barrier. It wasn't that Tazos wasn't able to do it. There's just a bit of a language barrier, right? Mm-hmm. So he knew that I spoke English because he had done something with, I had asked him a question or whatever. Well, he knew I spoke, so he grabbed me, right? And then he does it. I move with him, same speed, everything. And he's like, he's like happy he can demonstrate, right? The whole time I'm doing this, Tazos is staring at me like this. He ain't know about the Kung Fu genius at that time. Dude, I wasn't the Kung Fu genius. Oh, you was. But dude, he was staring at me like he wanted to rip my throat out and show it to me before I died. And I was like, dude, like in my mind, I'm thinking like, it's just a demonstration, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But he was looking at me like, like with such rage. And I was thinking like, why, this guy's supposed to be a master in Wing Chun. Why is this guy so angry, right? Like, how does this, how do you get to be at that level of skill and and be like so raging angry about, uh, this was a non-event. Language barrier? Yeah, but can you imagine if I'm trying to demonstrate with you Yes, and I'd it's be not, jumpy too. And probably. it's not working, right? And I just go, oh, okay, let me grab. And I grab Mikey Dean instead. Yeah. All right? Yeah. Would you then be staring at Mikey Dean? I with... might. I'm I'm, okay. Dre, I'm very Dreish, you know, Dre okay. Day when it comes to that. Maybe that was a bad example. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was my, that was my Sifu for you right there. <laughs> so last time uh, I talked about my boy Jürgen, Gauteng Jürgen, the yes. Norwegian guys, right? Yes. And don't, I'm going to get to Heinrich Pfaff, but I got I to tell uh, you. I got to tell you this one story because I told the story about how Jürgen beat up the chicken, all right? How he chain punched a chicken, right? Yeah. So I'm going to tell another Jürgen story, all right? Yeah. Now, all right? Jürgen, he doesn't even have social media. Jürgen is not out. So I I feel okay telling the story because it's maybe not the kind of normal story you would tell in mixed company, all right? I'm here. Jürgen, as I mentioned in the previous podcast, he liked to drink. He liked to have a good time. There were two Norwegian boys, Gaute and Jürgen. Gaute was like me. Mm-hmm. We were nerds. We would train six hours. We would come home. We'd cook food. We'd go over our notes. We'd practice. We'd watch TV, and we'd go to sleep. And we would just talk about Wing Chun, and th- we were nerds, okay? Mm-hmm. Jürgen, after class, would come, would take a shower, would shave his head, put on his clothes, and he'd go into town. Club, All right? He'd go club and go to the bar, and he worked at, as a bartender, and, you know, that's why he got in the fight with the chicken guy, whatever, right? <laughs> <laughs> right so you're gonna occasionally would hit the sauce a little harder than on other days okay <laughs> let's put it to you that way right i don't i don't drink gout doesn't really drink right but one time i was in berlin it was actually the time i taught my first wing chun class that's so a bit of kung fu genius trivia for you mm. with well, the first wing chun class i ever taught berlin germany right one of my seeings invited me there i was still training at the castle and he just asked me to like teach a small class while I was there in the nice. school. I taught it. That was the first time I taught Wing Chun. So anyway, I take the, the train from Berlin back to Heidelberg. It's like mm. a five hour, six hour ride, right? I take it to the train station. Jürgen is supposed to pick me up. All right. So I get to the train station. I get out of the train and I see Jürgen there. And Jürgen comes up to me and goes, Alex, I'm really drunk. I'm going to need you to drive. <laughs> All right. <laughs> And I'm like, all right. I mean, I, I was tired. I just got off the train for six hours, right? But I'd rather I'd rather drive than be dead, right? Yeah. So I'm like, no problem. So you know, we go out to the parking lot, I get in his car, and he goes, can we stop by and get something? Now, Germany is like... Um, what? Germany, yeah. after a certain, like... I mean, it's maybe different now, but like after 8 o'clock, all the stores are closed. Sundays, everything is closed. Such a pain. Like, you, you come from America, shit's yeah. open 24-7, as mm-hmm. we here in New York. Mm-hmm. And it's like, man, if you don't get your grocery shopping in by 8 o'clock... You know, you out of luck. Yeah, you ain't buying steak at midnight. All right. So anyway, <laughs> you know, it was like a later time. the The stores were closed, and he wanted uh, he wanted something to drink. I mean, something to drink. The He's sauce. already drunk. He wanted more sauce. Sauce. So where do you go? You go to the gas station because they have a convenience store in there, right? Mm. So we go to the gas station. Jurgen is already drunk at this point, right? And so you know, I buy like an iced tea or something like that. And he buys those little shot bottles or whatever. Yeah. You know? Okay. And I so, drank the vodka. <laughs> So he buys a bunch of that stuff, right? We get in the car, and it's like a 20-minute drive to our place from, from there, right? It's not a super long drive, right? And we're in there, and he's he's drinking, all right? Mind your homeboy's already sauce, yeah, right? Yeah. And he's telling me, because I had been away from Heidelberg for about two weeks, and he's kind of catching me up, what they were doing at the castle, blah, 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 blah. So uh, we get we get to the house, 
and uh, Gaute is there, and I'm like, hey, we hang out, and I catch them up on what I did in Berlin. Mm-hmm. We're talking and shit. And Jurgen, he keeps drinking. Holy he keeps smokes. Drinking. And it's about 11 o'clock at night, about midnight, and Jurgen goes, I'm going to go, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out now. I'm going to take the car. Holy And we're smokes. like, uh, we're like, nah, you're not. So Ga- they, they, the Norwegians, they had one car. They shared it with each other. Mm. So Gaute, he's like, well, Jurgen says this. Gaute goes, he takes the car keys and he freaking hides it, puts them under the couch or some shit, right? Jurgen starts looking for the keys, comes back 15 minutes. Oh, I can't find the keys. Oh, sorry. I don't know where they are. He keeps looking. You guys know where the keys are? Nah, I don't know where the keys are. He's so drunk, he doesn't really, like, obviously, we know where the keys are, right? He's like, oh. He keeps looking around. He goes, I'm going to hotwire the car. Holy okay? smokes. Problem is, okay, Jurgen knows as much about hotwiring car as I do astrophysics, okay? He doesn't know how to hotwire a car. That drink is right? special, but yeah, that's a yeah. special drink he he's had. Get, he's, getting some, <laughs> he's getting some liquid courage here, right? He doesn't have these skills, right? <laughs> So he goes, he comes back in. He goes, oh, can't hotwire the car. He goes, <laughs> he goes, I want to go. Okay. And this is the part where I kind of toiled over whether I should tell the story or not. So we lived in a place called Dillsburg. Okay. Which was next to where the castle was. You can't even call this a town. You would best call it a small village. Okay. Mm-hmm. A village. We don't use the word village in English to describe anything outside of like from the medieval times. Yeah, all right. Yeah. I, we lived in a village. It, had, it was one bakery and one ATM machine, okay? Just to give you an idea, all right, where we lived. And it was way up on a hill, and we were surrounded by thick forests. You know what is normally found in those forests? Bear? Boars, wild boars. You know what happens if a wild boar sees you? It's going to bite you. It's going to take a bite out of you, right? So we wouldn't go jogging near the <laughs> woods because you had to be careful. They were boars. Oh. Yeah. All right? Boars, all right? I seen okay. snatch. So I, I yes, know how that works with exactly, the exactly, exactly, right? And we were like up on a high hill, and Jurgen goes, "There is," and this is why I toiled over whether I should tell the story. There is a house of ill repute. Okay, I did call <laughs> a house of ill repute. Okay, all right. Let's just say a house of ill repute with an excellent reputation. All right. Now he claimed he had seen this place in a even smaller town <laughs> that was across the Necker River. Gaute and I were like, what are you talking about? Like, we'd never heard any. Like, maybe if you went into Heidelberg or you went into the, the big town or something like that, right? You know those places. They have the red lights in the windows. Right? In Europe, you know. You know what those places when you drive by, right? But he's telling us that he found one of these places in, in this small town across the river which is like in the opposite direction for where we normally like we don't drive in that direction we even know why why is he even going that way for anything Mm. right he claims and he goes i want to go there now i feel like going to the house of ill repute with an excellent reputation right (laughs) yes those were basically the sounds he was making it's funny you weren't even there all right so so anyway he goes i'm gonna take the bike oh we live a bicycle. We lived on a hill like this. You're not taking a bike down there. That is death. That is like those those fail army videos. You ride a bike down that hill, you're going to die, son. You better be Dude. on the back wheel riding the brake the whole time. Or you will die going down that oh, hill. Oh, that's so All right? cool. Especially, we're in the country. There are no street, drunk, there no street no lights. lights nothing. No street lights there. Yeah, it's man, not like here. No and he's drunk, right? So anyway, Gaudet and I are like, Whatever, man, you do what you got to do, right? I mean, at this point, we're going to have to physically restrain his ass if we don't want him to move, right? So he leaves. Gaute and I, we keep talking past midnight, maybe 1 o'clock. And I'm like, all right, I'm tired. I want to go get some sleep. I live right next door, all right? We live like in a – our apartments weren't houses. They were adjoining, like they were connected, oh, okay. right? So I'm like, all right, so I basically go around the backyard, go into my place and go in, right? We go out, we look. The bike's still there, all right? So he didn't take the bike, all right? Anyway, I go to sleep. Next morning, I get up, go next door to Gaute, make some breakfast, right? It's like 9, 10 o'clock. Yo, man, where's Jurgen? He's like, he hasn't come back yet. Holy shoot. All right? And we're like... The boar's got him. Yeah, I think like, yeah, what's going on here, right? So we're like, all right, we'll wait until noon. If he's not back by noon, we're going to go out. <laughs> we're going to go Jurgen hunting out. <laughs> You, out for it. It's yeah. now called Jurgen Hunting. Yeah, what are you doing? Jurgen, Jurgen, Jurgen Hunting. Right? So anyway, around noon, he stumbles in. Okay? 
still drunk as a skunk. Yeah, I All know right? that feeling. And he goes, and we're like, dude, where were you? And he goes, the question is not where was I? The question is why and how? <laughs> <laughs> and so basically yeah! <laughs> he went out to walk on the street. He's like, the street's too dark. So he got this idea. So he's telling us what happened the night before when he left the place. He's like, so I went out and I started walking down the hill and it was just too dark. And I thought, hey, the road is very windy and then I got to go all the way around. But if I just go down the hill through the woods, it's a straight line to that town. Boom, this dude's nuts. He walked through that thick ass woods and he says, I don't remember much, but I was sliding most of the time. <laughs> All right. And he had like dirt skids up his pants. So you can imagine he's sliding down there past the wild, the wild boar is probably a night to look at him and go, what the right, like, We like, don't want that. Yeah, we don't, <laughs> we don't, we don't dude, want that. Dude, this dude's crazy enough to go down here. Right? He slides all the way down. He tells us. He goes all the way down to the bottom of the hill. He looks up. He's in that small town that he was talking about. Dude, he found the and joint. He goes, it was the first place he found. <laughs> All right. You know what? Good night, everyone. God bless you. Good night. <laughs> and then he goes in there and he yeah. procures services. Yeah. It's also a hotel. And they're like, do you want to spend the night? Because then you sp spend the extra money, you spend the night. He's like, sure. Do you want to buy some champagne? Sure. You know he does. He, he starts likes to drink. racking up extra services, like spending the whole night, oh. the room. The extra booze. The next day, they give him the bill. Bill's like six, seven hundred U.S. dollars, which is a lot of money at that time. All right. Crazily enough, the place took credit cards. Most places in Germany don't take credit cards. This place took credit cards. Oh, see, they know what they know what it they is. They know what they know. He takes his credit, dude. He was so drunk. He showed us the credit card slip. He just wrote an X on it. <laughs> He couldn't even sign his name. It's just an X, like in a like in a Looney Tunes cartoon, yeah. right? Oh, Crazy, and he came back. But that was Jurgen, man. The last time I ever heard from Jurgen, all right, was a few years ago, all right, maybe 2006. I remember because Bush was still our president at that time. Jurgen calls my cell phone at some weird time, like <laughs> like 10 o'clock at night here. But you know, it's six hours ahead in Europe, so he's calling me at 10 o'clock at night here. He's out, right? Your man's out there getting the establishment. He goes, uh, Alex, uh, I need you to settle a bet for me. He goes, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of money on the line here. I need you to settle it. That's what I'm calling you, right? I'm like, okay. He goes, because you can imagine, he's a bit impulsive. So he also gambles a bit and shit. And he goes, is there a bridge from Staten Island to Manhattan? Like a direct bridge. And I go, No. Uh, the bridge, you know, you have the bridge that goes to Jersey and then you have the Verrazano, which goes to Brooklyn and there's no bridge from Manhattan. And, and he goes, shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just lost a bunch of money, man. I'm like, all right, well, well, Good thanks night. anyway. And I, go, I go, hey man, when are you going to come visit us? He goes, oh, I'll visit you guys when Bush stops being your president. All right. That was two, three presidents ago now. Right. He still doesn't come back. That was the last I ever heard of Jurgen, Right. So it gives you kind of an idea of some of the weird characters we had. Is he that alive? We I imagine he doesn't have Facebook. He's one of those guys. He's one of those. He's a bit of a conspiracy theorist. He doesn't trust social media. He doesn't trust anything. He's an off the grid kind of dude. Well, you know what I mean? That, that's good. At least, you know. Yeah, it would be nice to catch up with him, you know. Before we get out of here, I got to tell you about Sivo Heinrich. All right. The man, the myth, the legend. The man, the myth, the legend. So I followed him. He was like, he was my boy. I really liked training with him, you know. Mm -hmm. It's one of these things kind of breaks your heart a little bit. I, uh, I, towards the end of my, my time in Germany, we went to, uh, he taught a seminar in Berlin and he brought me along with him. Like I got to drive in the car with him to Berlin, which was crazy because one, when I first came to the castle, I thought this dude didn't even like me. And I thought he was like the shit. And like now come to the end of my trip, I'm going to Berlin with him. I'm shooting the shit with him in the car. For me, that was like a huge achievement. It was really nothing for him or for most people. For me, that was like a big deal because yeah. he kind of felt like, and now I'm like in his circle a little yeah. bit, right? So anyway, I get my first level technician. I leave Germany, come back to New York. We got all the crazy New York stories yeah, I was talking yeah. about, right? Then 2005, I invited Sifo Heinrich to the U.S. Now this 
was some Mission Impossible stuff because, as you know, like I talked about earlier, there was a bit of a Get it an, an iron shower curtain between Europe and Hong Kong. And now when I was in the States, I'm now a Hong Kong guy because I'm learning directly from Sifu Leung Teng. Oh, uh, I see. All right? Sifu Heinrich is definitely a European guy, right? I can't have him over teaching seminars because I'd get in trouble because I'm only allowed to invite like Sifu Leung Teng and Sifu Lao and stuff, which I'm fine with. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to bring him over because... He's, he's someone I learned from, and I, I just want to bring him to the States. I'm not bringing him over because I have these plans of having a super secret seminar, and I want to take money away from any of those guys, right? I just want to bring him over, and he came. Oh, fucking sweet. The sweet. first time Sivo Heinrich ever came to the U.S. was to come and be with me, oh. all right? Which was crazy, right? He came and stayed. At, at that time, uh, I, I was with, went to Connecticut. We was with my parents because we had the bigger house over there, yeah. right? Uh a small ass apartment in New York, you know. So I'm over there. He's, my parents got a big place, so he's there. We're coming into the city, so he's actually been to this space here. All right. Oh wow! And he wow. would come, and it was like, dude, it was top secret, like no photos, no, no like you couldn't let anyone know he was here. I told one of the U.S. instructors uh, that he was here because that guy was a big fan of. He was Siva Langting's student, but he was a big fan of the European Wing Chun organization. Yeah. Him, and another high ranking instructor who's still in Siva Langting's organization now, they flew up to New York to train with Sifu Heinrich privately while he was here, all right? One of Sifu Leung-Ting's top guys who's in Texas, who's still with him right now, came up here secretly behind his Sifu's back and learned privately from, oh, from Heinrich, dude, right? dope. So that was totally crazy. And Sifu Heinrich taught a small little seminar here, like very, very unofficial. So my first generation of students, you're like your Seeing Elliot and stuff, they, they got, got a to, chance. They had a chance to see him. They met him. Oh, all right? dude, shit. Yeah, it was crazy. Like for me, so that was like that was such a big deal. Having him here, spending time with him, like it was so great. I had such a good time. For me, Sivo Heinrich was uh, really one of the most skillful guys. Now there are some people who don't like him because he, he could be kind of moody and stuff like that. I thought he was great, and mm -hmm. I got along with him fine. He goes back to Germany. This is 2005, and very shortly after that, he left the EWTO. He had some, you know. Some issues, some politics, stuff like that, right? And uh, that's fine. After he quit the EWTO, because normally when someone leaves the association, you're not allowed to talk to them. You can't deal mm -hmm. with them anymore. He quit the association. I called him. I said, hey, like, I know you're not part of the association anymore, but, you know, like, I respect you. For me, you're you're the boss. Hell yeah. All right? Yeah. I said the Schaffste in German. Like, it's kind of like saying you're the boss, right? Schaffste? So, yeah, like the sharpest, right? Nice. Just to let him know, like, I'm not going to be one of those guys that now you left the association, I'm not going to talk to you anymore, mm -hmm. right? Like, things are cool, right? Everything was fine. I wouldn't see Sivo Heinrich for three years. It was 2008. And I tell you, man, that shit almost broke my heart. Because Sivo Heinrich, as I mentioned, like, he was someone that he was, like, the biggest thing for me, mm -hmm. right? And just the fact that I was able to travel with him and do a seminar it was such a big deal, right? Yeah. He came and visited me. He stayed in my home. Yeah. It was yeah. huge, right? Yeah. He left the association. He started doing his own thing, which is fine. And then I was in Berlin visiting one of my friends. And it just so happened on that weekend while I was visiting Berlin, it was like a social visit. Sifo Heinrich was in Berlin teaching a seminar for his new association because at that time he's <laughs> doing his own thing. So through a mutual contact or whatever, it's like, hey, we'd love to meet him. And we would go and have a dinner or something like that, right? You know, man, you ever like, you get a good idea. I don't know if this ever happened to you. You ever get a good idea of someone and suddenly from one day to the next, you see him again and you don't know who this person is anymore? Yes. And that... I look at myself like that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> when it's someone you care about, man, that shit breaks your heart, man. Yeah. So we met at a... a Different like, person like all a, of a sudden? Like a sushi restaurant. And first of all, he was there with one guy that I knew and he was there with a few other guys, all right? I didn't know who those other guys were. And it was weird because in the three years that I was there in Germany, I knew the guys who were around Sivo Heinrich. Right? Like, you knew who his yeah. boys were, who his entourage were. I didn't know who any of these. Like, he's got a whole new, he's got a whole new entourage, right? Which is fine. But you ever see, um, you ever see uh, one of these dudes, he sat across from me, right? And Sivo Heinrich was being, like, super cold, he was like kind of sitting there with his arms folded. I'm like, hey, how are you doing? And he started saying all this like derogatory stuff about Sifu Leung Tang. Like, oh, that guy is just this and da 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 da. And, you know, and, uh, and, then, oh. and, and then he goes, and at that time I was still in Sifu Leung Tang's organization. He goes, yeah, man, do you have his contact information? Meaning Sifu Leung Tang. And I'm like, yeah, of course. I mean, I email with him all the time, right? I'm still thinking this is the same Heinrich from before. He's like, yeah, yeah, like, I, you know, I want to go, I want to like beat him up. 
I want to, I want to challenge him. I want to fight him. I'm looking at it, it's like, what? And I'm thinking in my mind, I thought it was a joke. I'm like, you want to fight a dude who's in his sixties? I thought it was a joke. Like what, what dude fit dude yeah. goes, I want to challenge some dude in his sixties. Yeah. You know, and he was serious. And then like, and, and I was, and he was like all salty. And the crazy thing is he left the European Wing Chun organization because he had poli political problems in Europe. It had nothing to do with Sifu Lering Ting. You could hold a gun to Sifu Lering Ting's head and show him a photo of Sifu Heinrich. He wouldn't know who he is, mm -hmm. even though he's done demos with him because he doesn't remember. This is not yeah. someone, yeah. Yeah. but in Sifu Heinrich's world, Sifu Lering Ting was, had something to do with, he was now really angry at him and he was saying all this stuff. And I was like, huh? And there was another dude there. You ever see Return of the Jedi? Yeah. Remember Jabba the Hutt? Yeah. Remember Jabba the Hutt had this nasty pet that was in front of him and yeah. he kept going, ha 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 that thing had a name? Yeah, he had a salacious bee crumb. Yeah, wow. He was a that's monkey a lizard, all right? A monkey lizard? Yeah, that's what they got in the Star Wars lore. He's a monkey lizard, right? Like, <laughs> Sivo Heinrich had some dude in his entourage who was that monkey lizard, and he was sitting across from me. Talking hot shit. The whole time, mm. right? And then, and then I said something like, oh, you know, well, when I was your student in Germany and that guy, you were never his student. Like, and it was kind of, I didn't know who this guy was. It's kind of like, who the F is this guy here, right? Oh. And he goes, when Steve, and, and it's like, he was like speaking for Sivo Heinrich, like Sivo Heinrich now has people who can speak for him. Oh. And he's going, when Sivo Heinrich was teaching at the castle, he was an employee of the EWTO, but no one who learned from him at the castle, those were not his students. He was just fulfilling his obligations uh, as, as an employee of the EWTO. And I'm thinking like, and I'm looking at this guy and I was there with my Sihang. And you know in your mind where you imagine a scenario and then you snap out of it? Yes, where I was, everybody got... I was ready to jump over that and just grab bust. him by his neck. Yeah. I had never been... I am a very easygoing guy. You, you know me. You think so? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm super easygoing. All right. All right? I'm All right. not easily spurned to violence. I wanted to grab this guy by his neck and just punch the living shit out of him. I had never been so angered by someone because he was just this disrespectful, salacious, be crumb looking yes man. <laughs> All right? And then he goes like, and then someone said something about uh, Sivu Elman Lang, who I had learned yeah. from, the, yeah. the late Sivu Elman Lang. He said some shit about Sivu Elman Lang. Like, oh yeah, that guy didn't really teach anything. And I'm thinking, yeah, he didn't teach you anything because you're an asshole. He's Chinese. You go to him, you show me, you know, because the Germans sometimes say, oh, Chinese guy, go ahead and show me something. And mm -hmm. that's not how you learn from Chinese people. It's not how you learn from anyone, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then so he said this stuff and I was getting really angry. Like I was super angry, right? Heinrich is there kind of like with his weird challenge to see Volang Tang. Salacious B. Crumb over here is saying all this kind of stuff. And I was just like, I was about to lose it. And then my Si Heng was with me. He, he I, under the table, I was uh, bawling a fist. And he just grabbed my hand. And he said, don't worry about it. We're going to go. And we left. And he said some stuff to them. I don't need to repeat that here. But we left. All right. And that was the last time I saw Sibu Heinrich, man. Wow, yeah. that's foul on... Crazy, huh? Yeah, yeah. Now... I, I don't know him, but now I feel jacked up about the fellow now. You but know here's what I'm the thing. saying? Here's the addendum to that story. We're Facebook friends now. He occasionally likes some photos on my Facebook. And I'll occasionally like some photos on his Facebook. It's water under the bridge, man. That was 2008. And you know what else was weird? You know the reason why I was in Berlin at that time? One of my best friends, he was one of my students. His name was Klaus. You one of your C hangs. You I, train with me. All right. I, really a close student of mine, close friend. He had just gotten killed in a motorcycle accident. Oh. You know? And uh here in the in Midtown, uh taxi ran through a red light and hit him on his motorcycle. And he was in a coma for a few days. I went to see him in the hospital, not responsive, and he died. Ooh, sorry, and he man. was like my best friend. You know, sorry, it wasn't just my student, but like he was he, you would have loved him. You mm. would have loved him. He was the coolest dude. And I kind of like, I got into a bit of a depression. Mm -hmm. And my seeing in Berlin said, hey, you need a change of scenery. Why don't you come to Berlin, spend some time, get out of New York for a little bit. So I went to Berlin oh, because so I, had, needed, all that I needed to there. get out of New York because I literally just lost my best friend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then while I'm there, it's like, oh, Siva Heiner's in town. And then I went and saw him on that trip. When I was like still going through that stuff, yeah, man, it was weird. And there was some. I was angry after that, man, because I'm like, I don't know who this dude is anymore. And so I remember that night after we left the restaurant, I called my web design guy back in New York, 
And I said, take Sivo Heiner's name off my website that I ever learned from him. And I said, take every reference off him off, right? Just take it off. And for years, my senior students know I wouldn't even mention his name. But then at some point I realized, I hold on to this anger. First of all, he might have been in a he might have been in a bad up. mood yeah. that day too. I dig it. All right. I dig it. He might have come with some stuff. And I can't stand there holding this anger because of one weird night for the rest of my life. Then it's like I'm, ta I'm taking the poison expecting someone else to die. All right? I'm holding on to that. That was a good proverb you did. So did. I realized, yeah, I read it somewhere. Somebody put on a meme probably with Bruce Lee's photo. Oh, cold-blooded. So then I decided I'm good oh. and I let it go. And I'm cool. I don't, I don't harbor any weird feelings or anything like that. It is what it is. As far as I'm concerned, I'm cool with Sifo Heine. I'm cool with everyone. And that's the Castle Stories Part 2. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> Not to end that on a downer. <laughs> you pretty much did. I, I, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty jacked up internally did, right did, did, did I mention Jurgen went to a house of ill repute and almost got killed? Let's say what it is, family. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the in Germany. I'm editing all of this out. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Word is I'm a kung fu genius. Technique speaks for me, not lineage. Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one. Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Seagung. And I produce masters. You surpass us. Your kung fu stiffer than corpse and caskets. City Wing Chung is the house I built. Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt. Alex Richter, always the... All right, let's do it. Woo! All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will continue to go into his time in the Gang and Cam Castle. The Gang and Gangnam Style Castle. Gangnam Style Gangnam Castle. Gangnam Style. All right. <laughs> <laughs> on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will continue to dig it up. Governor Vaga. I got a governor. <laughs> lots of gems, lots of techno music. Yo, F bombs. Ketten Faustosen. In the Langenzeel Castle in Germany. Lots of gems, lots of douche, douche, douche. Techno music, music, music. And lots of Ketten Stuschen Stotzen. Let's get to it. That's not even close.